Good evening. Good evening once more. My name is Hildy Fraze Thiessen. A few of you have heard me say that more than once every week. I want to welcome everybody who's new here today and all of uh, the many of you. I'm beginning to recognize lots and lots of faces who uh, have come back week after week. It's just absolutely wonderful to have such such a lively and engaged audience. Welcome to the third event in a nine-week series of readings and lectures celebrating the most recent 50 years of Mennonites writing in Canada. So far, we've enjoyed engaging, delightful, and instructive sessions with Rudy Weeb and David Waltner Taves, and tonight we'll hear from Patrick Friesen. Before I introduce Patrick to you, I'd like to once more acknowledge the support of the various sponsoring bodies within the college, Conrad Grable, uh, who have made this event possible. So various bodies I've mentioned before, including the Academic Development Fund and the Canada Council for the Arts. And to observe that if there are poets or aspiring poets among you, there's still room in the poetry workshops being offered free of charge by the college tomorrow morning and afternoon with Patrick Friesen, uh, two more in mid-February with Julia Spiker Kasdorf. Registration forms are available online and there are also some sign-up sheets uh, outside the door on the table in the back. And I'd like to welcome you, too, on behalf of the college to come back to Grable not only next Wednesday, but this Friday uh, for the annual EB lecture. Jim Pankratz will be speaking on uh, Gandhi and the Mennonites at 7.30 in this room. As has become my habit here, I'd like to entice you to come next week with a little bit of uh, an introduction to next week's guest, Magdalene Redekop, Professor Emerita of Victoria College at the University of Toronto. A specialist in comedy in Canadian fiction, she'll introduce her own lecture on laughter in Mennonite writing with an act of clowning, a brief one-woman drama called Sush Funk and Her Old Bag of Secret Shunt. Now, a few of you might know that last word shunt, low German for junk, and uh, those of you for whom that word has no resonance will delight nevertheless in the pleasure Professor Redekop takes in remnants and distortions of her own low German, or Plautdeutsch, native tongue. She once remarked that she, presumably like other Mennonites of her generation, who like herself were nurtured in one of the tight rural Mennonite communities of southern Manitoba, assumed that God spoke high German, Jesus spoke low German, and only the scribes and Pharisees spoke English. <laughs> Elsewhere, Professor Redekup observed, and I quote, I do not deny that I mourn for the loss of my mother tongue and that I share the Zehnsucht, or nostalgia, of those who long for community. What I desire, however, is not a community of harmony, but rather one where differences are acknowledged and where hostile egos are dissolved by laughter. Invoking the restorative possibilities of laughter, especially at human foibles, Magdalene Redekop encourages us to consider how, for example, the fall of a clown on a banana peel can restore us briefly to humility and humanity. Magdalene Redekop is a long-standing great supporter and companion of Mennonites writing and has published widely in the field. She's sure to be engaging, entertaining, instructive, and provocative. So do come and hear her. And I know she's going to be entering from the back in costume, so you want to be here on time. And now to our featured guest, Patrick Friesen. Patrick grew up in the Manitoba community of Mennonite community of Steinbach. He moved to Winnipeg for university, and after earning an honors BA in English and a teaching certificate at the University of Manitoba, he taught junior high school for six years, and then became for some 15 years program organizer and producer of radio, TV, and film projects, including several films about artists for the Manitoba Department of Education. He moved to the West Coast in 1996, and until 2008, taught creative writing at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Vancouver. And during all these years, he spent untold numbers of mostly late evening and early morning hours at what he called the typer, writing and rewriting poems. Like other Manitoba 
writers of Mennonite heritage, Patrick started his professional career as a writer with Manitoba's premier literary publisher, the small press called Turnstone, which published his first seven volumes of poetry. From the early The Lands I Am, 1976, and Blue Bottle, 1978, through The Shunning, 1980, Unearthly Horses, 1984, and Flicker and Hawk, 1987, to You Don't Get to Be a Saint, 1992, and Blasphemer's Wheel, 1994. These volumes were followed by other volumes published by other publishers, A Broken Bowl, 1997, St. Mary at Maine, 1998, Carrying the Shadow, 1999, The Breath You Take from the Lord, 2002, Bordello Poems, 2004, Earth's Crude Gravities, 2007, and most recently, Jumping in the Asylum, 2011, of which he has several copies with him, should anyone care to purchase one later on and have it signed. Several of his many poetry volumes were nominated for or won national and or regional awards. Volume after volume was praised by other writers major literary figures in Canada who declared, with Patrick Lane, for example, we are blessed by these tireless sweet words, these whispers in the dark. Or Don McKay, who observed that in Friesen's poetry, time and again, the reader is struck not just with amazement, but with gratitude. Or Dennis Lee, Patrick Friesen is one of the poets we cannot do without. Or Janice Kulik Kiefer, this is poetry that matters, poetry that calls us home and calls to the homelessness within us. Patrick Friesen's poems have been gathered in anthologies and taught in university classrooms across the country. His work has been read on CBC radio and performed by music groups, theater companies, and dance collectives. He has collaborated directly with significant Canadian dancers and singer-songwriters, jazz pianists, and through the act of translation with other poets. In 2006, he published a volume of nonfiction entitled Interim, Essays and Med Mediations, where in the refined language of the poet, he explored a variety of subjects that have occupied his imagination for a long time. The lives and work of Russian poets, for example, and the entrancing art of Canadian dancers, the haunting voice of Richard Manuel from the 60s rock band, rock group, The Band, and his own Mennonite upbringing in rural Manitoba. And there was theater. Patrick Friesen's play, The Shunning, based on his narrative long poem of 1980, was first pub produced in 1985 at Prairie Theatre Exchange in Winnipeg. Other productions followed in both Canada and the US. The play was reprised in Winnipeg last year by the Manitoba Theatre Centre with ecstatic program notes by Mennonite poet Di Brandt. Another play, The Raft, premiered at Prairie Theatre Exchange in 1992, was later produced here in Kitchener at Theatre and Company. In 1985, Patrick Friesen organized something called the Missing Mennonite Cabaret at a restaurant in Winnipeg, the first celebration of the new Mennonite writing in Canada. In 1992, one of Canada's most influential literary magazines, Prairie Fire, published a special issue on his work. And there, fellow poet Di Brandt wrote in what she called a love letter to Patrick, her mentor and friend, and I quote Di Brandt, so many things you taught us about language, how to ground the writing in simple words, Anglo-Saxon words, earthy words, avoiding abstractness, how to maximize the feeling in the words by concentrating the rhythm, how to engage with cultural and family memories by making enough space in the poems for anger and desire to speak to each other, dynamically, how to draw on the speech patterns of the Bible and old hymns and rock music for inspiration and rhetorical power without falling into dogma or superficiality, how to locate oneself on the edge of a community, dangerously, precariously, the cutting edge, without falling in or out, how to live passionately in and for language, how to speak in a time so profoundly marked by alienation about love. Patrick Friesen now lives in Brentwood Bay, a village on Saanich Inlet, north of Victoria, British Columbia. He still teaches on occasion, and thankfully, he continues to write. Please join me in welcoming him.
That was the best obituary I'll ever get. <laughs> well, you ate it. Try buying? Yeah. Um, Hildy mentioned that these uh, events on the, uh, week by week were a celebration of Mennonite writing, but they're also a celebration of Hildy as she retires, because I'm sure every one of these people has stayed at her place, and Paul and Hildy have hosted them and fed them, and certainly me a lot of times, and uh, have become dear friends. So to me, it's a celebration of her career. And by extension, Paul's. He was always part of it. <laughs> Um, get organized here. When Hildy asked, um, suggested I come here and, and I said, what do I do? She said, go over your career. So that's been the exercise and that's been uh, very useful to me as I found a lot of things I didn't know I'd written, um, <laughs> for example. And just suddenly seeing something that was written 35, 40 years ago and it's connected with something I did yesterday. It's quite astonishing. On the other hand, there's some things that uh, I've written them out of my will. They're, <laughs> they're gone. So I'm, I've gone over the work. It's not really a career. Uh, I don't know about other writers, but I don't think of it as a career. Career is being a hockey player or a Mountie or something else, something you choose to do. And I never chose to be a poet. That was, I never sat down at some point and think, you know what? It's good money in poetry. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Yeah. And it's so popular. <laughs> See it on the street corners. Actually, in the 60s, you would in Winnipeg. I remember there was a guy that used to sell his poems, handwritten poems in the corner of the bay, Memorial Boulevard. Uh, so going over the work, asking myself, uh, how does one begin writing? Why? You know? And the, the thing that I would conclude is, it's a useless thing, which is a serious comment, actually. It wasn't utilitarian. It didn't do it for any purpose, other than that's how my thinking worked. And I thought if I could put that on the page, that would be enough. I didn't think I would publish a book ever in my lifetime. I really did think all poets were dead, because we studied them in school. The most recent poet I'd ever read was W.B. Yeats, who died in the 30s. So, but I'll do it. Because my mother would do it, too. She, she, Saturday night, she would sit in front of the window looking at the snow falling, and she'd be jotting down poems, which no one knew she did. She just did it because she liked it. And that was the same for myself. So it's a useless activity, and that's what I love about it. I'm going to try and do an overview, and it's kind of pretty much chronological. I may have missed a few things and got some years wrong. Uh, but I'll kind of go through the works chronologically. But I want to begin by saying, I'm calling this talk, Stop Meaning and Start Singing. And that kind of encapsulates my whole writing life. Um, I personally think that when I was born, I didn't have an idea in my head. So what did I have? I had at least five gateways called the senses. And that's where I got my information. And that information began to get organized got organized by my parents and eventually the school system and so on. But I never forget that I began with my five senses and that's how I understood this world. And as a poet, I have to remember that because I still use them to carry ideas rather than stating them. What happens, I think, when you get educated is, and when you learn language, it starts with learning language. Language frees you and it imprisons you. It's obvious how it frees you, you know, if you're literate, you can go a lot further in your society. But it imprisons you into a language that other people have shaped for you, ahead of you. So in a way you're not free, you inherit a shaping from your society, from your town, whatever. Uh, maybe your immediate family. And so I have that mixed feeling because language started to take me away from the immediacy of how I apprehended the world and understood it. It became a filter through which I which I formerly hadn't needed to understand the world, right? With the increase of language education, I got more abstract, and that's true of all of us. I began depending on abstract notions, ideas, concepts. And I think a poet is one of those people that holds on 
to that original apprehension of the world to deal with, with ideas. Sound and imagery are the two that work most uh, well in poetry. And I have my earliest memory of sound is winter, being in a sleigh my father had built, which had a caboose kind of top, and I'm in it, and I hear my parents' footsteps crunching in the snow. That's my earliest memory of sound. And it, it's deep inside. I, I had been in Vancouver two or three years when I suddenly realized I needed to hear that sound. And I happened to fly into Saskatoon, I made the cab driver stop beside a field, and I crunched around in the snow in the field, <laughs> just to get that sound. Probably not the earliest thing I saw, but very early was the funeral of a very old woman who wasn't directly related to me. I think she was an uncle by marriage's mother. But she was a typical old midnight lady with, with a black dress and a black kerchief with red roses on it. That stayed with me. But what stayed with me even more was as we walked by her coffin, there was a fat blowfly on her forehead. And that to me was absolutely beautiful and absolutely terrifying at the same time. It was mortality, that fly. And a blowfly is also called a blue bottle, which I kind of pretentiously used for the title of my second book. Pretentious because I was trying to make a pun out of it, right? Bottle of ink and so on. Remember Emily Dickinson? Flies. Some of her best poems are flies. Anyway, those are early visual sound memories. Um, placing meaning ahead of singing, forcing the poem into meaning, is like putting a saddle on a sparrow. And as a poet, I did that plenty of times. I had to learn to get rid of that saddle and start listening. And singing along. And I always I wanted to sing two ways. I wanted to sing like an angel and I wanted to sing like a demon. What did that mean? I wanted everything. I wanted all the shadow, the light, everything. Some of the singing that uh, got to me is rock and roll. And I'll read a poem at one point that, that refers to that. I think rock and roll got to me because where I grew up, I would say, it was a fairly repressive situation, the town. And when I heard rock and roll, and when I was alone in the house and I cranked up the radio, I would bounce off the walls dancing. Dancing was not allowed. The body was not allowed, essentially. And so that was an element of freedom that loosened up a lot of things for me. But what came with it was certain voices. Hildy mentioned probably my favorite voice in rock and roll, a guy called Richard Manuel, who is buried not far from here, an hour's drive from here in Stratford. Uh, he sang for a group called The Band. When you heard him singing, even if he hadn't written the lyrics, he made them his own. It sounded like he was singing his life's existence to you. And I think that's what a really authentic voice does. Another voice that I loved, John Lennon. Later, when his son released an album where his voice sounded just like Lennon, you listen to the two, no, no comparison. The one's grown up with everything, including a lot of trouble. And the other one grew out of wanting the world, a young boy wanting the world. He was either going to be a criminal or a successful singer. I mean, he probably ended up being both. Tom Waits, and rest in peace, last week, Etta James died three or four days ago. She taught me how to phrase my poems when I read them out loud. I mean, she didn't teach me, she was an influence, as was Van Morrison. So the voice was always really, really important. And the rhetoric of sermons would have been the first, probably, my first direction in terms of voice. Although, I have to say, most of the ministers in our church were pretty bad preachers. But occasionally there'd be a really good one, you know, who actually took the trouble to use his voice for effect. There were instrumental voices. Uh, in the world of piano playing, you actually call it voicings, right? If there are pianists here. Bill Evans, if you don't know who he is, he's a jazz pianist, died in 1980. Really influenced how my long lines developed because of how he improvised on the piano. And another pianist that had an influence on me was Marilyn Lerner, a Toronto piano player who taught me what voicings were. It wasn't hitting the note, it was how you hit it and how you played it. And I remember discussing once with the Bill Evans CD playing how 
something could go from your head through your arm, through your finger into a cold key and get to the bottom of that key and do something specifically. And she said, that's voicing. Someone can hold it. She said, Evans can hold a note longer than anyone else I know. And he's not hammering it, but somehow he holds it. Anyway, so these are all influences. Um, I discovered too at one point that we have a head voice and we have a body voice. And we use our head voice most of the time. And that's a voice that doesn't do that much for your writing, for me. All of this is speaking for myself. Um, singers are taught to sing from their body. Why don't we speak that way too? You know, when I'm just doing an ordin ordinarily talking, someone in the street, of course, I'm t it's almost like I'm talking through my eyes. But when you take the time to lower your voice, you, you read lower down. And you bring with, you, with the voice your whole body. You don't just bring the abstract brain. That coincided with my developing a long line because I realized the first poems I wrote were short line poems, and I did it just because everyone did that. And at public readings, I found I was not stopping or pausing at the end of the lines. I was just carrying on to the next one. So, so why is it broken up that way? I need to lengthen the line. The first time I tried it, the line actually went right across like that. And Prairie Fire was then called something else. Manitoba Writers News or something. And they published it in the middle sideways so that they could accommodate it. Then I had to learn what to do with that and so on. But I'll refer to some of that. I'll just end with this intro by saying it's the physical world that is incredibly important to me as a poet, the reality of it, and how images can carry your ideas. Uh, what did William Carlos Williams say? No ideas but in things. And Lorca, who's probably my favorite poet, said, a poet is the professor of the five senses. I'm going to read a couple of couplets from a guy called Archibald MacLeish. I discovered this poem about a week ago. Of course, I googled it. And then I'll get into the, the main body of this. A poem should be wordless like a flight of birds. A poem should be equal to not true. And the poem ends with, a poem should not mean, but be. Every poet has a suitcase with him. And it looks pretty comical, too, because there's all kinds of shirt ends and sleeves hanging out of it, and lots of threads hanging out. You, in other words, you come from somewhere. I come from a Mennonite town, a Mennonite family, with all that tradition going back 500 years, um, and that specific town that I grew up in. I come with the music that I heard there. I come with the language, which was primarily low German, high German in church. We were the lowbrow Mennonites, Kleingemeinde, which strangely means small union, but it was the largest church in our hometown, but very conservative in many ways. My grandfather Swatsky was a gourd eater, and he could smoke, and he could drink wine. I never figured that out because at the same time they said, that's a conservative church. And the preacher was standing on the, on the front steps, preaching. I mean, smoking between the events in the church. So socially, I would say they were much more flexible than what I grew up with. But it's all that stuff, that culture, the, everything that's tied with it, you go with that. And yet my early subject matter had nothing to do with it. When I first began writing, like probably most poets, just general kind of poems, until shortly before I got a book published. And when I realized, you know what? I have a subject. I'm walking around. I am the subject in a way. It's that whole suitcase full of material I have. And at that time, I didn't know a single Mennonite writer. I knew Rudy Weeb existed, but I hadn't read him. On the West Coast was a guy called Andreas Schroeder writing poetry, but I hadn't read him either. So there were no real models for me. And I thought, that seems a small subject matter, writing that man and I think. But in fact, it turned out to be rather huge. And I think it was Faulkner that said, you create a really small town and it's the world. Heritage, family, the prairies, and my grandfather's farm. Grandfather Friesen had a farm that figured in my life and does to this day. I still go there some, 
there's a different owner now, but she's quite happy to have me come onto the farm and look around. It's changed a lot since he was there. He grew nothing but rocks there, which I think <laughs> gave it all that resonance. If it had been a successful farm, I, I think I would have forgot it. So I'm going to begin with a couple of poems from my very first book. Um, the first one deals with, it's called Teutonia, which was the name of one of the ships that Mennonites came from Russia on. Um, my great-grandmother came at the age of four from Ukraine. And uh, what page? Uh, page four. Teutonia. Riding the sea for two weeks toward the delivered land, engines grinding below. They were closer to home than they knew. Their portion as thin as the youngest son, their purpose accordingly brisk. They adhered through the night the water gave them. Pray for guidance and for grace. Not a man knew the sea well enough to call himself sailor. They stood strange and stiff before the wind. Not a man knew the sea, yet they remained unwilling citizens in the slope and shift of the waves. In the morning, the smoke of a fog led through Atlantic deluge. Each night, the sun went down to the sea, and always higher, coiling birds, white and fire-winged, shrilled. And the second one from that book, it's, um, it's my grandfather on his farm. As I said, it, it literally grew stones. Um, that was his most obvious activity, was loading up the stone boat and taking the stones to the middle of the field and piling them up. He had two horses called Barney and Prince. Once he, had bu he bought a car, I don't know when he bought it, a Model A or a Model T, and apparently he got into it, lost control of it, and drove through his wife's flower garden. And he got out swearing, in low German, threw the keys as far as he could, and that car stayed there for the next 30 years. <laughs> I, I was a kid and it was still there, rusting old Model A. And I, I asked about it and that, well, yeah, Grandpa drove it there and he threw the keys. <laughs> so he came to town every week with his two horses and a wagon. And once he came to our house, he'd always come on Monday because he knew my mother had made chocolate cake on Sunday, so there'd be some left over. He wrapped the reins around the, the uh, telephone pole and he had a bunch of potatoes in the wagon. And a neighboring kid, a friend of mine, and myself, I don't know I, who did the worst part here, s scared the horses. And they took off. And I just can remember them going down the street with potatoes flying everywhere. And grandfather swearing. <laughs> Stony land. Lean and stark apart, striding across the stubbled earth, the old man knew the hairs of sorrow. Each knuckle of his hands a fist, each finger a bent direction. He knew the plod of a slow horse with dust like chaff at its feet. The Sunday chat of hens making a stillness in the barn. And he knew the clatter of clay on a box where his woman lay. His mouth a wound, his voice harsh and his words graceless. He sat gaunt in his straight chair, unlamenting. It's kind of a prairie poem, for sure. His wife died when uh, they were about 30 leaving him with five, six children. The Spanish flu, 1918, 1919. And he apparently became a more bitter man after that, especially as his wife's family rejected him for some reason at that point. Blue Bottle is the third I will read from these early ones. Um, and it's, it's an issue that became important to me, which was my father's death when he was quite young. He was 55. And um, he represented a lot of things to me, including what for me was a very stiff and inflexible religion that he was very true to. And he was a man of impeccable integrity. So I had a mixed admiration and kind of despair in my relationship with him. It's called Blue Bottle. There you go, it's the fly again. He died on a stone pillow, his hand on a banister. There was nothing between us. For the moment, I was the staircase and the last touch. He, the debut between touch and ghost. I heard a blue bottle in the blind. The droning was 
summer days, chewing the stems of lilac leaves, the fall of yellow afternoons, sons glinting on the blue hood of her 53 Dodge, and father hoisting me to the hot fender for a photograph, sitting still and father brushing sand flies off my back. Between touch and ghost, while I heard time, everything happened at once. That's kind of first two books. And then everything began to break open for me. I began to write with a long line. I don't know exactly how that started. Big influence was a writer called Jack Kerouac, a beat writer, not his poetry, but his uh, fiction. Um, I read On the Road in the late 50s. And it felt like reading the Bible, actually. It's very similar rhythms, King James Bible. And the other influence, of course, was the King James Bible and the rhythms. So in other words, Shakespearean language. And I knew I wanted to tell stories, and I knew I wanted what we would call poetic still moments. How do you do that? How do you work with that? And uh, so I, this is one of the first poems where I began playing with that and opening the window and letting things that I didn't think previously were poetic in any way, letting them come in. Some are going on fall. My, my daughter is singing a song, and I still remember how she sang it. She made it up. It's all in the poem. I began bringing in everything except the proverbial kitchen sink. Uh, there's a reference to a zero combat plane, which is a World War II Japanese fighter. And I think that was another reference I was going to mention. Anyway, a heap of cement blocks and a garden beside them. My barefoot daughter eats apples off the ground and sings an old story. The willow leaves are sticky from last night's fogging. Weeping birch, too, and strawberries and the oak out front. I swat at a fugitive mosquito, honing in suicidal as any zero combat plane. The sun is a hammer, driving my head down on my neck, until my eyes glaze over with the ache, and I sit in a buzzing tunnel, not moving. From somewhere, my wife's voice says, no strawberries today. The bees must have fallen in the fog. No strawberries rest of the summer. And I say the effect couldn't be that fast, but then why no strawberries? And my little girl's singing about when she used to be a little girl. She's only three, which seems young enough to me. My wife points out the pruning she's done on the dogwood, and I notice through my haze how Japanese the dogwood looks, the intricacy of angles or something, maybe a thwarted kind of economy, whatever. The buzzing continues, and a cement truck rumbles by with its space capsule turning the foundations of another house within it. An acorn plummets, bouncing off the sidewalk into my lap. I crack it open. My wife says it's poison. I chew it anyway. Birds eat them. Why not me? And still my daughter singing. I used to be happy. I used to be mad. I used to be happy, so that's what I had. And as if a Carnegie Hall of men thrilled to every note and word, and she afloat on their applause. Thank you, gentlemen. And the sun's got me, the world's reeling, and it's Christmas in my head. God rest her. God rest her, Mary. Uh, it's about this time I decided I needed to do a book-length exploration of where I came from. And I started one that turned out to be a false start. <clears throat> Pretty well the equivalent of a manuscript which I threw where all dead things should be and started again. And that's when I wrote the book called The Shunning. And that became an issue for a number of reasons. One, um, I saw a TV program called Man Alive with Roy Bonnesteel, and he was talking about the Mennonites that were being shunned in my hometown, late 70s, from a particular church which was called the Haldemont Church. And what shocked me was to see my neighbor from across the street, quite a young man at that time, he was probably 35, and his wife. And they were in shock, you could see. And later I found out why he was being excommunicated. It was because he owned a motorboat. And he refused to get rid of it. So we excommunicated him for pride. And they asked his wife to shun him, and she refused, so she was excommunicated. So I didn't know what these people would do. I mean, that's all they knew was their church in that small town. They couldn't suddenly take off and live in Prague or something. And it occurred to me that that was a very violent spiritual act 
from a people who believed in conscientious objection and so on. I'd learned that from my father. My father studied his Bible during World War II because he thought he probably, probably should fight, but the Bible wouldn't let him. So they gave him a choice, go to jail or work in a lumber camp for the government, which he did. So I had all that background, but how could you shun someone like this? So that started it off. And I had a dream or a waking image of a man lying beside a creek with one boot untied and a rifle lying beside him. Why, I don't know, but it was an image that stayed with me. And then one night I woke up and I had an idea and I wrote 12 pages of dialogue between myself and the man buried in the grave I was sitting on top of. I think the idea of speaking to someone who's no longer with us and missing that wisdom and wanting to communicate it. Anyway, out of that came this shining. And lots of visual images. I don't have the book with me, but the front cover has a gaunt face, not a relative, but a Mennonite man I found it in the archives. The back cover has a photo of my father when he's about four, and his mother about a month before she died of Spanish flu and so on. That's why the visuals inside the book too, and they're kind of running through it. I tried to make it look like a novel. I knew that'd be the closest I'd ever get. Anyways, there's just a little section, just a brief bit from The Shining. Johan and Peter are the two men. Peter is a character who has decided that if God is a loving God, he cannot possibly have a hell, which was once called the Denkian heresy in um, Winnipeg, in the First Mennonite, United, First, Mennonite United, First Mennonite Church in Winnipeg, where in the late 40s, a bunch of people left because of this heresy, this belief. So he's had that, and he's been kicked out. Pride, he wouldn't give in. And his brother Johan is kind of a trickster and knows what to do to get along with everyone. The man, Johan, who fished here with a crooked nail, who splashed in this creek with his woman when the sun was high and work could wait, Johan, who told how they ducked each other, how they swam underwater and exploded through the surface near drinking cows, the cattle lurching, front legs in water, backing up the bank, their large heads swaying. The flames he endured, the iron in him. Johann, I remember, leaning against the fence, his bony hands gesturing as he spoke. Around us, the wreckage of his farm, a rusting harrow, bone buildings careening, and grass surging against the barn. Johann remembered his brother, who tore the curtain and went blind, who to taught Johann fear, and not fear. That the man, that the child dies no matter what, and a man carries his funeral with him. You never know how many people you bury with a man, nor how many are born again. Come, said Johan, let's go back to the house. Ruth bakes bread today. It's good when it's still warm and the butter melts. Listen, he whispered. That rasping sound, that's a yellow head. See it? Over there near the creek. And I saw a blackbird with a sun for its head. Oh, das ich tausend Zungen hätte. I found my family coming into my poems. Um, the shunning was set on my grandfather Friesen's farm. And I used events. I used the event of when his house burned down when my father was four years old and ran back into the burning house and he had to be hauled out again. And my grandfather decided he needed to save his telephone. It was the only telephone in the neighborhood. And it was new. And he reached in through a window and had an epileptic seizure and fell into the fire. And his 10-year-old daughter, who told me this when she was 85, hauled him out. She remembers how his shirt tore and so on. Very, these are the fine details that you need to know, right? Dragged him out there, and the house burned down. Neighbor, neighboring farmers running over with their useless pails of water. And so the house burned down. I use those kind of events, the death of my grandmother with um, Spanish flu as well. But it's not autobiographical. I change things. And my father's youngest sister had her daughter write me and chastise me for that book. Because the guy Peter in it commits suicide. And the letter said, you know very well Grandpa did not kill himself. Well, of course I knew that. He hadn't. And I tried to explain how you use what you know and then you build on it. Right? That's the perpetual problem. After my father died, I um, wrote a series of poems sometime later. 
I had been somewhat distant from him um, for various reasons, including I was a mama's boy. I was very tight with my mother, not with my father. In those days, the father saw that as a normal way to be, right? Child, that's up to the mother. I'll go and earn a living. Also, he came to me with his kind of rigidity to repre represent uh, the rigidity of the church as I was experiencing it. So there was a gap between us. And I called him father. Anything else was too intimate. I couldn't let myself get close enough. And so after he died, I wrote this series of po poems where I called him something I never ever had called him was Pa. And they were a series of Pa poems. Uh, my father was a one-eyed man. He was blind on his right eye. There's a reference to him as one-eyed, which used to always intrigue me. He'd take me hunting and he'd aim. He'd shoot left. He did everything else right. And um, he'd bl been blind since five, I think. No one figured it out for a long time. Naked and nailed. I remember those carpenter's hands, thick fingers drumming the table, fingers that tightened around my biceps, lifted me right off the kitchen floor, down basement steps, and there we were in front of the furnace, me pleading across your knee, both of us wishing we were someplace else. But you not spoiling the child, and you swung that leather high, me twisting to look up, your arm flung out, seeing you naked and nailed like a child to a tree. How could there be so much love? I wish I could have seen you sidestep or shout the words of your hurt. Even better, I would have loved to see you leaping on your long, narrow feet, howling and sweat flying from that fine muscled chest. What's a father if he doesn't let out the whirling dervish, the gypsy, or the juggler? You one-eyed monster, you saw more than you let on. Maybe more than you ever knew, but you couldn't find the words for me. You rowing that boat into mother's dreams, someplace out there, maybe still looking for the words, and one night with me sleeping creepy, you'll find them and you'll find me. Sitting in bed, shivering, maybe before I find you, you'll tap me on the shoulder, I'll turn, I'll recognize you. And see, you old dead man, how I start with my grievance and I always end up with this goddamn love. But I tell you, that won't happen every time or it'll kill me. He was a lovely man, by the way, <laughs> even if it didn't sound that way. Stood a little tight. Um, the man who invented himself. I'm opening up here, I'm bringing in everything, and I'm, this poem's in sections. I haven't read this poem in 30, 35 years, probably. Family. One, I remind you of the man who invented himself out of clay and spit, amino acids, if you will out of photographs and dreams, out of the right hand of God and baptism, he invented himself. He thought as a young man he would read palms in the pub or display his memory for the names of Spanish poets. He writhed in fevers of justice, saw they weren't just, and was almost lost in a map of emotions. The man who invented himself failed to explain it all to himself. No matter where he left a distinct impression, he walked toward obscurity. Two. After splashing for a while, my son sits quietly in the bath, examining his fingers, how they wrinkle, his feet, his penis, and whatever else he can reach. Three, in 1977, I sat in the northern square of the Golden Cathedral. When Lawrence came to Guadalajara, he saw this cathedral first, from a distance, hills between, this dome glowing in the west. I remembered reading that in one of his travel books, I walked back to my hotel, a shadow on Mexican stones. Four, I once was lost, but now I'm found. The man who invented himself didn't write that, but he heard it that the day he was born and couldn't forget it. You might say that line was the true mystery for him, to give him something to do. You could hear him humming between drinks, or laughing, or mocking, or posturing, and more than once he turned the line around. The man who invented himself invented mirrors, though he was told it had been done before. You can imagine how upsetting that was to be such a fool, caught with his foot in the door. But he knew his history, and everyone was wrong. He knew it hadn't been done before. Five. I thought just now how to continue the life and times of this devious man, how to keep your interest in one I hardly know myself. A man not particularly interesting, who likes to believe he invented himself, and longs, like all his kind, for the grave. 
My son interrupts me, calling to share yet another anatomical discovery. You and me, Dad, he confides. It's kind of touching. The only real solidarity I've ever felt. As I leave the bathroom, I turn to the mirror and for an instant see myself turn toward myself. Six. You're always where you've been, said the man who invented himself. You're always where you're going. Seven. There's going to be a meeting in the air, he sang. He liked the tune, imagining the invention of selves, remembering the streets of towns and cities, the songs, Amazing Grace on Home Street, or Green River in Guadalajara from a shortwave radio. Songs that reminded him of other songs, sidewalks that recalled other sidewalks in other towns. In the evening, a bath, the now drinking with the others, and always singing in his heart, I once was found. I don't like that poem very much, actually. <laughs> it doesn't feel right. Um, about this time, uh, Kim McCaw at Prairie Theatre Exchange uh, asked me to adapt the book, The Shining, into a play, which opened up huge doors for me. Um, it's after that I, I started writing short plays for radio. I started working with dancers, with musicians. It just Everything opened up. Because I discovered collaboration wasn't as frightening as I thought it would be. I was lucky that my first collaborator was a dramaturge assigned to me for that project. His name is Per Brask, who taught theater at the University of Winnipeg. And it was so painless, and we became best friends. So everything just got better in terms of writing. My long line was still varying between short and long, but I was slowly learning how to write a line that was suitable for how I read. Um, and I eventually found that once I got to the long line, it actually duplicated how I naturally thought. So those short lines weren't how I thought. So why would I write like that? So that was all happening at this time. And a very big step for me, I began using language that I had thrown aside because it was religious. I remember it took me several days before I used the word Lord in a poem. And it could mean so many things, of course. But I thought, that is what I grew up with. That was my first language. Why would I leave it behind? Maybe I could make it live again for myself. And so that started happening. And that's when critics would accuse me of suddenly having become religious, which was interesting, because I'd always been religious. Just not how they thought. Um, Zen Buddhism entered my life gradually, not as a massive force, but as an influence. I went to a Buddhist church for a while, but found it, <laughs> it was pretty much the same as going to Mennonite church. <laughs> <laughs> you still had a guy in a suit preaching. And but why I went was um, in the middle, they'd have a ceremony where you'd ring a bell and everyone would be quiet and meditate. And it seemed to go on forever, probably two or three minutes. And I really liked that. But otherwise, yeah, it was, Never mind. But it began entering. And so there's a poem here, um, and there's a reference to Richard Manuel in this, the singer. It's called An Audience with the Dalai Lama, because I used to wonder what I would ask him if I ever got to talk to the Dalai Lama. Or the old-fashioned Padi do. On the one hand, a leaf in the shrub beside you. On the other, family and work. I have never seen God. I've been empty and filled and empty again. What can I say about what I know? Hymns that come easily to my lips while I walk, an ancient anger, and the bags I carry filled with hats and shoes. I don't think I know much beyond what I know. My left, my right hand, a leaf, wife and children, and sometimes a stony eye. My room, you wouldn't believe the books and clothes all over the floor, the records and stamps, the lamp, my smell, and the typer. Nothing much has happened there if you think of it, and I have. On the other hand, nothing more has happened outside the room. I grew up with lilacs. There are lilacs outside my window. There's not much I can make of that. It's like looking at old photographs in a way, like catching a second wind or an animal in me, sniffing out its old grounds. Sometimes I think I have a question. I want to have a question about things that matter. My body used to give me pleasure, what well, still does, but it's beginning to break down. Maybe there's a question here. My knees, 
my eyes. Sometimes there's a ringing in my ears and who knows what's happening just now in my most hidden cell, some small detonation. But it seems clear where everything's going. I feel a lot more stupid than I did. Is this wisdom? <laughs> Listen, my love is someone other than me. This must be what I need. She goes on journeys. You should see her walk toward the clearing, trees making way. You should see her in her wedding dress, the hem wet in the grass. You should see her when she drops the armor of her veils. When she's away and it's late, when I crawl into bed, I find she's dressed the emptiness beside me with her gown. All night I'm restless. I wake when my hand finds silk. My legs want to wrap around her. No bed has ever been this empty or so full. It feels like God. A man can't say what he is, that he needs to rut like a plow knows earth, that he loves it. That he bends his knee to words, he loves this too. Falls insensible sometimes for the beauty of memory and ruin. Sir, Richard Manuel died a lousy death, hanging there cold as a fish. I can't explain it. Just listen to any of his songs. Just listen to how pure and sad a man's voice can be when he wants paradise, but his arms aren't long enough. Some voices belong to everyone. The boy in me doesn't like conversations. He's busy, wants to be free. A word for what he remembers. He could have said captured, surrounded, or surprised. He dreams time before love, when he could sing the words. Didn't matter, only the voice he was. But the man in me accommodates love and loss, contemplates smoke and mirrors from a distance. He moves toward religion like prey to the lion, a leaf to earth, or a fish to the hook. Does the prey feel ecstasy as it kneels into the lion's need? Its stem hardening, does the leaf desire release? No, I don't look for answers. The questions are old and will grow older. I want something other than rhetoric or ritual, maybe a gesture. My devotion to the Lord is imperfect. There's some fight left in me. I may be hooked, I am not landed. What's there's my room, my hands on the typer, my eyes, we used to say, what's the diff? My children chewing at my knees, my wife smiling through the window, where is she going? Where is she coming home? She loves me, she loves me not, she loves me. What's there's the usual concoction, hubble bubble, eye of newt, babbling tongue, the old fashioned pas de doux, me and you. Sometimes mother's on the phone, do I love her? Yes, I do. And I still have father's hat. No, I haven't seen God. I live with angels, some fallen. My wife sloughs her gown, my pants at my knees like some clown. My son with his other world eyes, you could never know them or their danger. Or my daughter's prayers at night when everyone's asleep. This is a way she speaks. And this is what I know, what I need to know. I want to redeem love before it does me in. nineteen eighty seven as a poet I felt myself in full stride everything just felt natural the way it worked uh, a lot of projects a lot to do I had my subject matter all kinds of subject matter interrelating uh, I didn't have to think um, I worked on a dance with uh, Stephanie Ballard who was a choreographer in Winnipeg at that well she's in Winnipeg again uh, she lived in Winnipeg and she worked for uh, Winnipeg's Contemporary Dancers where my daughter was a student, which I think is how I got to know Stephanie. Uh, Margie Gillis came in for this project. Uh, Ruth Cansfield, these are names of dancers who were pretty big at the time. And I wrote this piece and Stephanie would take the blue pages, I was writing blue, and she would put them on the floor of her apartment and she would work on the choreography by walking on the paper. She actually felt that the word came through the soles of her feet. And uh, I wasn't going to argue. <laughs> if it works for you, it works for me. I found it very interesting, that interrelationship of a concept, like a word, on a piece of paper with the physical body. It's quite interesting, the possibilities. So it was called Anna, and it was named because there was some reference to Anna Akhmatova, a Russian poet I really liked, died in 1966. And my great-grandmother, Anna, who was also born, not in Russia, but in Ukraine, 
and uh, had had a big influence on me. She gave me permission to be a poet as far as I'm concerned. She died when I was 10, but that's all I needed was to have known her. She was a trickster. I remember even at a young age seeing her get an argument started at a table and then be quiet and watch while everyone fought. <laughs> and she was like that. And uh, my second play, The Raft, was based on her story, which was some place, <laughs> place called St. Jean Baptiste near Altona, Manitoba. She was married to, I think, a pretty wealthy farmer. He had a lot of workers. And they could not have children. And there's no one alive that can tell me now what happened. But uh, I'd heard that that um, it was, he couldn't. At any rate, she got pregnant from a farmhand. And that's how my grandfather was born. And I wrote a play called The Raft where I speculated what I believed was that her husband and the farmhand had actually arranged this. Because everyone knew he wanted desperately to have a son to inherit the farm. So I actually still to this day believe that that was arranged somehow, but I have no proof. Um, after he was born, um, uh, his, not his biological father, but but his mother's husband got very jealous and tried to shoot him with a shotgun. Came into the house with a shotgun and the farmhands wrestled him off. And that night my great-grandmother dressed him up, swaddled him up in clothes and walked some 90 miles to Winnipeg and never saw her husband again. And brought up my grandfather, who was my dearest relative of all. He was a fabulous guy who, uh, of course, was ashamed about his past. And so didn't know that I knew, my mother told me when I was teenager. So that's a play that's in the future, but she's present in this thing here I'm going to read. And it's a series of bits and pieces in a way. And you have to imagine the dancers, unless someone wants to actually dance here. No. You dig anyone's family and you've got interesting stuff. My father married into this family and took great delight when the Carillon News came out in Steinbeck announcing the wedding of an offspring of the biological father because he stayed in southern Manitoba and we knew who he was. And he would say, do you want to go and visit the Yushvista? Which was, of course, biologically true, but no other way. It's funny, if that had been his family, he would not have found that funny. <laughs> it's always funnier when it happens to someone else. And of course, as a grandson, I love it. It's a fabulous story. It makes me admire my grandfather and his mother all the more. She uh, existed, years later, she came back to the territory, her husband had left. She um, washed the floors of the town hall and things like that in the Altona area. And always had a huge garden to feed her family, her son and, and the fam when her son grew up, my grandfather and had children, she was still gardening for them. And my mother tells me a story that she would do the laundry of a lot of women in town. So one place where the rich and the poor met. And one thing my mother said they learned was never to praise anything of hers. Because once a woman had praised her dress and she had gone to the other room, took it off and wrapped it up and gave it to her. Which she would do apparently. If you liked something, it was yours. I remember she had a big, big chest full of porcelain and things. Let's say it was 1958. A sail along Silvery Moon was on the radio. It was Sunday afternoon in July. I remember the river and swallows swooping low over the water. Silver medallions fluttering on their chests. The Catholic boys ran along the springboard and jackknifed into the Seine River. There was something ominous about the muddy water. Like a dream, anything could be there. Venomous snakes, weeds, and roots to clutch at you. Or simply depth. Something ominous, and those lean, white bodies of faith disappearing with graceful dives. I held my breath each time, wondering if this one would drown forever and not return. How could he possibly rise from that darkness of river and overhanging trees? How could the water give him back to light? But always each boy exploded into air, returning from death or dreams, flinging wet hair from his eyes, shouting defiance at the shore, and each of us shivering there. And then the sun was so bright, dancing in the spray around the diver's head, so bright on his long arms cleaving water, 
you could hardly believe in anything. Let's say it was 1958. I was sitting on the fender of Father's Blue Dodge, and it was Sunday, and I didn't want to ever leave the river again. I was eating a persimmon, trying to think of God. It didn't work. My tongue wouldn't let me get away with it. There are no miracles, only mirages in the desert and disappearances in the river. There's nothing human that isn't betrayed, and I know nothing but what's human. My hands, my tongue, my face in a mirror. Grandmother wouldn't show me her photographs, said I'd never know what I couldn't, would I? Her life before me. But I think I remember her in the orchard. She was a girl. Her hair was soft and flowing down her back, her legs brown with sun. She said sometimes there were angels in the orchard. She saw them among the trees, but she wasn't sure. And if there were, what should she do? Sometimes there was a black dog or the neighbor's boy with a stick. Sometimes there was nothing she could remember, and she was running for her life. This is how she learned to pray, she said. This is how she worked her way out, her hands at the clothesline, her eyes on the sky. I don't love the prayer rug, obedience or disobedience, nothing that absolute. I love the Babylonian body and the human wound. I love the surprising word, the sinuous approach. I like the world, approximately. The way grandfather smoked a cigarette in the garden, his feet lost among the potato plants, the way he smiled and I smelled the drifting smoke, his stories hovering among the raspberry canes, the way he leaned on his hole forever. I love words in the air, balanced between mouths and ears. I love the way there's smoke before there's stone. But it's true, I think. There's not much a voice can say. There's a limit, I guess, to art. There's no end to desire. And as part of that piece, everything showed up here, there's a dialogue between two men. Every word of this is true. What a coincidence. What a coincidence that we met. Oh, reminds me, I heard of a man somewhere walking down a street. A baby crawled out a window, 14th floor, and fell on the man's head. Both survived. A year later, to the day, same man walking down a different street. Child leaned against the screen window, 14th floor. Screen gave way and the child fell on the man's head. Same man? Yes. Same child? Uh-huh. They had moved to a different apartment. They lived? Yes. And then? And then, that's not enough for you? <laughs> There's always more. Well, there is. You can imagine the man had problems. His neck was never the same. <laughs> it wouldn't heal. He visited a chiropractor. Thought the receptionist looked familiar. Hey, it was the child's mother. No, no. Listen, she looked familiar. He thought he must know her. He approached her and began a conversation. Before long, they realized they were twins. <laughs> they had been separated at birth and adopted out in different cities. Let's say their names were Bob and Linda. Well, Linda had married a Bob and Bob had married a Linda. They each had two daughters with the same names. What about the child? The, the child? The one who kept falling on the guy's head. Ah, oh. well, many years later, the child was a teenager, and the man, Bob, was desperately ill. His sister had just died. Same disease, of course. They had both divorced, moved in together. Their kids were gone, just brother and sister sharing an apartment, helping each other along. Well, she died, and he was going fast, so he jumped from a tall building. <laughs> Same building where the child fell on him? I don't know. He jumped, hit a car, stopped at a red light, flew in through the windshield, killed the passenger. Wait, it was the kid. No, kid was driving, it was the kid's mother. <laughs> You're kidding. No. Could make a person look up now and then. <laughs> That's true. You never know what's going to happen. Truth is stranger than fiction, or life, I guess. And here we are, a coincidence. I'm not so sure. Listen, are you adopted by any chance? No. <laughs> Listen, I knew someone once looked just like you. I imagine everyone's got someone looks like them. Your name, you must have a name. I'd rather not. Let me guess. I won't tell you. 
Well, then I'll guess what your name isn't. What? Listen, I've got to go. George, I'm not saying. Lenny, listen. Albert, I'm going. Emil, Frankie, Vincent. <laughs> True story. Um, continuing with what, what I would now call my long-limbed loping lines, they felt like, this is really, don't tell anyone, okay? Those lines felt like a long-legged woman, just graceful and running along. That's not true. Uh, there was a secretary working where I worked who was from Jamaica, and um, at lunchtime, she would go into an empty room and I'd hear her laughing. And she was reading Anansi stories, which are, is a trickster figure from Jamaica. I think it actually goes back to Africa. And I mean, cackling laughter. And this trickster was, sounded very much like my great grandmother, actually. Uh, always getting people in trouble and so on. Anyway, Jita Forbes was her name. This poem's dedicated to her. Uh, she fell seriously ill. And, and, um, I visited her a week before she died, and she was in an altered state and told me what she had done all night long, and she didn't say she was dreaming. She was holding up a mirror, and some hands were reaching to grab the mirror from her. She did that all night, she said, and she knew that was death. So a woman from Jamaica. I wrote this in that week between that visit and when she died. I don't think it's too much to ask that for a moment every wound heal and stutter toward silence. I don't think it's too much to ask for a hesitation of the highball thundering through our veins. Let's say we can halt fear. Let's say this room is enough that all streets and rivers flow here, that all gods drink at this bar. I know a woman from Jamaica who tells Anansi stories. She's laughing like a mischievous child. I know a woman who could outleg the Obia man, and she has, who could walk water, and she will. Tonight's her final dream, what each of us will dream, the world loosening and shifting like catastrophe, but it's only a single death. Is the music loud enough? Can you hear it on your skin? Are the chairs and tables dancing? Is the dolphin diving in? A woman is dying. When she takes my hand, I feel the chill of the cold mirror she has held. A woman is dreaming annihilation, hands reaching and rapacious, wicked hands that harass her. They want to break the mirror. She raises it high above them with her thin arms. She knows what this is, this encounter with the end. She has never stood a longer night. When it's over, she says, when Jehovah has come and the mirror whole, she'll see what is left, her long body in death. She'll know she was here in this blue place of water and grass. Is the dream loud enough? Can you feel it on your skin? A dying woman has climbed out of the dark agitation of prayer and terror with the ghost in her hands. A woman is walking by the water. She leaves her shadow and the willow. A woman is rowing away. I don't think it's too much to ask that for a moment every wound heal and stutter into silence. Let's say we can halt fear. Let's say the music's loud enough. We can hear it on our skins. And the chairs are dancing. The dolphins diving in. Jehovah's there because she was actually a Jehovah Witness. She tried to explain to me why she could talk with me any time, but she couldn't ha could not talk with anyone who had left the Jehovah's Witnesses. She was trying to figure out the rationality behind that. Okay, 1992, a very big time. That's when I wrote The Raft, which I've already told you about. Uh, if the shunning was set in Grandfather Friesen's farm, The Raft was Grandpa Swatsky's story, in a way, partial. You know what's amazing? I was speculating. I was discovering it for myself in that play. Some years later, I was at a Swatsky family gathering, and I heard a cousin repeating a story for my play, which I'd made up. It was now history. <laughs> And I said, Marlene, that was in my play. That's, I made that up. It never happened. No, no, no. Aunt so-and-so told me, too. So it's a done deal. <laughs> That's why I don't trust historians. <laughs> I know how history is made. Uh, aside from the various other things I started doing, I started getting into uh, translations with uh, 
at the behest of my old friend, Per Brask, who had been my dramaturge, he was a Danish guy. He had come to Canada in the 70s. And he said, do you want to translate some Danish poetry? So we did. And there is a connection between Danish and High German and Low German, both. But the way we worked it is he would do a literal translation and I'd be at my keyboard and I, I would repeat what he's saying, but I would say, can it be this way, can it be that way? Instead, this sounds better. I made it English. And uh, we translated four or five poets, and my favorite was a guy called Nils Howe. And I, I want to read one of his poems because it puts this whole poetry business in perspective. It's called In Defense of Poets. What are we to do about the poets? Life's rough on them. They look so pitiful dressed in black, their skin blue from internal blizzards. Poetry is a horrible disease. The infected walk about complaining. Their screams pollute the atmosphere like leaks from atomic power stations of the mind. It's so psychotic. Poetry is a tyrant. It keeps people awake at night and destroys marriages. It draws people out to desolate cottages in midwinter where they sit in pain wearing earmuffs and thick scarves. Imagine the torture. Poetry is a pest, worse than gonorrhea. A terrible abomination. But consider poets. It's hard for them. Bear with them. They are hysterical, as if they're expecting twins. They gnash their teeth while sleeping. They eat dirt and grass. They stay out in a howling wind for hours, tormented by astounding metaphors. Every day is a holy day for them. Oh, please take pity on the poets. They are deaf and blind. Help them through traffic where they stagger about with their invisible handicap, remembering all sorts of stuff. Now and then one of them stops to listen for a distant siren. Show consideration for them. Poets are like insane children who have been chased from their families by the entire family. Pray for them. They are born unhappy. Their mothers have cried for them, sought the assistance of doctors and lawyers until they had to give up for fear of losing their own minds. Cry for the poets. Nothing can save them. Infested with poetry like secret lepers, they're incarcerated in their own fantasy world, a gruesome ghetto filled with demons and vindictive ghosts. When, on a clear summer's day, the sun shining brightly, you see a poor poet come wobbling out of the apartment block, looking pale like a cadaver, and disfigured by speculations, then walk up and help him. Tie his shoelaces. <laughs> Lead him to the park and help him sit down on the bench in the sun. Sing to him a little. Buy him an ice cream and tell him a story, because he's so sad. He's completely ruined by poetry. Okay, I wrote a book called The Broken Bowl, which um, came out of several things, including I suddenly got very, very annoyed in those years by the smugness of Brian Mulroney on TV. <laughs> and it led me to thoughts of violence. And so I, I began exploring the history of violence in the human race. And my daughter had left, uh, she had hitchhiked to Central America. She was an anthropology student. And I started reading her texts and realized that's what I should have gone into actually at university. I really loved them. And I loved the whole thing of the dig and finding bits and pieces of our ancestry. I mean, really far ago, long ago ancestry. So that combined with the fact that I was also interested in Anna Akhmatova, the Russian poet, had written a lot of fragments because she lived under Stalin. And so some things came out. Sometimes a couplet would show up in one poem. It would show up by itself someplace else. And it would show up in another poem. It's like these little bits were looking for a home. So I wanted to work with fragments, and um, that's kind of all the background to it. A broken bowl. I'll just read a few short parts of it. Going down, Earth's diary, its broken bowl and ashes. Going down through shell and leaf and debris to initials on the stairs. Going down the ladder, breaking into an empty house. Going down to the world's mouth for an echo of the first orphan. Going down in an easy death a raw word in the star's cave. Where is the desert warrior? The city groans with anxiety. Who will deliver us from misery, from our small laws and gods? 
from the disease we wallow in, from our schools and work lines, who will bring fire from the desert? And there, where the desert meets the city, in a shanty town, where squalor defines our wealth, there, where God lies beneath rubble, where the bowl is broken, there, a moment we might miss, a glance, a caressing hand, you never know. There was a guy in my hometown whose name I never uh, did discover. I asked people and they, some don't remember him. He was a very old man who wore a long coat and walked long gravel roads. A lot of them were still gravel in those days in my town and collected stones. And he'd look at them and chuck them back or put them in his pocket and sometimes he'd lick them, which intrigued me. And I realized later <clears throat> he was looking for the color in them, right? The way I've gone to seashore sometimes, I, wow, that's beautiful. I'm going to have that at my desk. When I put it in my desk, it's just a gray stone because it dried up, right? Um, so this is, this is the, and I began to speculate many years after he died. I saw him die. He had a heart attack right in front of my friend Ralph and myself. He just turned, spun around a circle and fell flat on his back. Beautifully located between the Lutheran church and the undertaker. <laughs> Hard to believe. Anyway. And I wondered what he was, you know, his connection with stone and with the earth. And the man who licked stones. The man in the long coat licked stones, memorizing the world's first fire on his tongue. He didn't have time to speak, though he had nothing else. He hadn't come to words. His slow hands hung from the stillness of his torn sleeves, reaching only to touch what he might remember. With his hands, he carefully brushed dust from stones. With his tongue, revealed their rose or cobalt blue. He walked outside town on gravel roads. He walked outside love, too close to worship to say. Around him, earth's rubble and striations, sign and witness of the forge he longed to find. His mouth craving volcanoes, the taste of ash and rain, his mouth ground stones in his sleep. I thought he would vanish one day, spellbound in his cellar among the coal and roots. I thought in the end he might walk into the river with his heavy pockets, but there was no such privilege for him. With the years, I forgot him, or he became a shape I couldn't see, wandering around town. I don't know if he took form again or if it was time for me to see, but I did see him, merged like a photograph in its bath. He was walking past the church. He reeled suddenly with a stiff-legged pivot and fell straight on his back. No one falls like that the body in surrender to gravity. No one falls as if nothing matters, and nothing did. His eyes glistening like wet sapphires in snow, his dead eyes looked through us, seeing their way into stone. Okay. I'll read one clearing poem. I wrote a bunch of clearing poems. Clearings are an important concept in the prairies. I don't know if they're here. Uh, my mother has a piece of land that has a clearing, and I love to go there. And um, I once asked Patrick Lane, why is it that animals never walk into, into a clearing straight? They always circle for a bit. And he said, because they're afraid of the clearing. So they circle to see if there's anything in it, right? any danger, and then they enter the clearing. I think that's true. Anything could happen in this clearing. I even had Bill Evans playing piano in it at one point. And this, uh, this one's a, a, a surprise, religious meditation. When God tears at your heart, or you think that's it, you want that to be it, angels perhaps, or demons, when you need something to shape suffering, something to hold it with intention, when the night deepens and you stand slow and waiting for your eyes to take in the trees, when you make your way through deadfall, scraping your arms on the knuckles of a poplar, when the clearing flares with light, the moon's brilliance carefully milking the thistle. When the stone pile glistens and cools, sun's heat rising into the lowering sky. When nothing, my God, happens, nothing in the vastness of your small, rash living. When you have to laugh at the end of yourself, at the God you think you've reached. When you crouch at a cold Bethlehem as a constellation wheels across the clearing 
when the offering you brought lies scattered at your feet and the only gift, a broken heart. When you watch, as you always have, from the edge, suddenly aware, something breathes behind you. When you fear the darkness of bush, the animal there, but no safety in the clearing. When you find the body of the child, struck down in its ecstasy of light and lamentation. When you step into the barefoot prayer at last, when you pass into the open night. Okay, I worked with Marilyn Lerner. If you ever have a chance to hear her, she lives in Toronto, she's a brilliant pianist, mainly known for being an improvisational pianist. But uh, I've heard her play country music, I've heard her play with jazz combos. She has probably a dozen albums out. I have one of her pl playing um, with Cuban musicians in Cuba, uh, jazz musicians. She and I have worked together over the years and gone to jazz festivals and so on. And I've spent a lot of time with her and learning what she does with piano. She can improvise incredibly. I once read a, in her living room, read a poem and she played with me and it sounded quite fine. She pointed out that she had played a note for every syllable I had just said. And it all made sense, so she's quite astonishing. And once in a while, when the situation's right, I will improvise with the language too, which is a lot harder than improvising music, actually, because you have to make denotative meaning, right, for the people listening. It can't just be nonsense sounds. I guess it could be, but you might not be satisfied with that. So we've made a few CDs, and um, I'd like to play, I think because of the time limit, I play number 10. And what this is, don't put it on quite yet, um, Marilyn Lerner is the musical director, she's the pianist. A woman from in Vancouver called Peggy Lee is a cellist. And my son is on percussion. And it's all improvised. We never did this, that's the whole point. We do it first, you know, for the first time. And as you can probably tell, I start improvising on the words too. So if you can crank it up there. smile in the dark suit, the dark suit, that memory, and the thin smile, how easily it can be let go when time comes. It can be let go at dawn, as the body warms, as the body warms at dawn. It can be let go at noon, the crow looking down from the street light. Or with the drone, it can be let go with the drone of lawnmowers in the evening. It can be let go so easily during the sleep of the dream. In a moment, during the sleep of the dream, it can be let go in a breath. The thin smile and the dark suit, the body warming at dawn, and that crow looking on. It goes on like that. Um, maybe, can you play number one? It's just the piano and myself. Um, you get two different examples of what we we're working with in those days. Naked from sleep, you bend room. toward the sink. Cup your hands with cold water and splash your face. You raise your head and wake into the morning. But in the mirror is someone behind your eyes. Beard dripping and eyes bluer than you've ever seen. You stand there in the flesh that is not you. You have not seen yourself since the last birth. And you don't wonder after the first shock. You only ask where have you been so long? The 
one face you touch and you reach for the other. You are standing in a room in the world. When the door behind you opens. Thanks. It can turn off. Um, Loose in the House of Fundamentalism. I promised to read this an hour ago. You go dancing around your room, banging off red walls, pictures swinging wildly on their hooks, shivers down your backbone, tail feathers ruffling, and you playing piano with a ball peen hammer. Words and doors unhinged as night blooms in the brain soil, flowering like the watered grave. You're flagrant and lost, sniffing for primal heat, kicking your way through the room's furniture. Nighthawk or crow, this is the word, loose in the house of fundamentalism. Wings beating against glass, cries of blue fire, anger's call for vengeance, rocking on your toes, knocking the clock from the wall. A quiver in your bones, old as old, but who's counting? Bogman, Piltdown Man, and Lucy in the Sky. Bestial and defrocked. Some god, undone, with one blue eye lazy and the other dark and crazy. You skid, scuffing, linoleum, all feathers and mischief, careless damage along the million-mile wall. Bitching at some yellow-eyed parrot. Not enough! Nothing memorized, just holy ghost and a slippery foot. Wella, wella, sings the crow. Bird is the word, hopping from leg to leg, a cockeyed killer and a wry. Wella, wella, the next flight out of here, heading anywhere, and anything goes, and always it does. That was rock and roll. Um, you remember the song, Bird is the Word? Anyone? Wella, wella, bird, 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 blue bird's the word. Really great lyrics. Um, I always wished I'd written it. And I'll end with the poem for my grandson, poem for Jonah. Um, a reference to Madrid and uh, Lisboa or Lisbon, Madrid, because I love all things Spanish and go there whenever I can. And I have a book coming out in May, which is totally Spanish and Portuguese poems. I don't know what else to call them in English. And uh, although he's an adopted grandson, his father is Portuguese, so Lisboa. And they go there. I will carry you through the streets of Madrid or Lisboa. I will carry you through the end of my time, toward the fullness of years. Whatever else I've carried, my shoulders are the shoulders of those before me. Shoulders that carried shovels and shawls. Shoulders carrying the black and heavy book. And these shoulders hold the light of a helpless town, skin burned and burning. Holding the words and music of an era of glory and deception and always work. I will carry you as I carried your mother, as she carries you, and you will carry your son or daughter, and one day you will carry me. And the questions, have I arrived? And if I have not arrived, how do I go? Thanks very much. Good minute, I get organized first. <laughs> Any comments, questions? Or? Yes? Uh, I was intrigued in one of the first poems you read uh, by your reference to uh, the horse Barney. Mm. And uh, we had a horse called Barney, too, and we lived in Saskatoon, and I'm just wondering. We said, say, <laughs> horse. <laughs> <laughs> well, one. W one winter, my grandfather got lost in a blizzard. He might have ended up there. <laughs> now, I always thought that was such a great pair of names, right? Prince and Barney. <laughs> and you know the way those old guys, the way they yelled at their horses, which was completely, they loved their horses. But 
if you, the words were like curses almost, they're not quite, but you know, come on, oh, oh, you know, the rough voice gone. My, grand, my grandfather was very rough voiced like that. And at first I was shocked. Do you hate these horses? But it was love. Anyway. <laughs> it wasn't a question. Oh, one of those. It got you served, I think. A little, uh, you know, Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a Jungian scholar could work with that. <laughs> Other comments or questions? David. When you, when you told the story about the man who licked the rocks. Yeah. I think it's in the the brain that changes itself. He tells a story about blind people and putting a computer chip on their tongue and, it, and using it to stimulate the visual cortex so they can see through their so uh, the, literally. So the chip actually f feeds into the tongue? Yeah. It's like walking on paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> Same thing. Not quite, but that's interesting, huh? No, this guy was an absolute stranger. I didn't know who he was and what. I did a reading in my hometown many years ago. I asked my uncle who was in the audience and who knew everything about that town. And he said, there was no such man. <laughs> and by the end of the reading, he says, I remember him now. <laughs> but I don't know his name. <laughs> so, and my friend Ralph remembers him dying too, so he saw that. Yeah. You know, the towns are dead without these kind of guys. Every town has to have its eccentrics, its alcoholic, its crazy person, whatever. Or it's deadly boring. You have to have that. We had two town alcoholics, so we were doubly blessed. <laughs> Each interesting for different reasons. One of the guys, I'll tell you this. Uh, I first encountered him when I was pretty young and the Salvation Army was playing on a Saturday night in the town. Playing. And this guy with a steel gray brush cut was shouting out requests. And none of them were hymns. <laughs> they were all military songs. And they played them for him. And he, would, he marched on the spot like this. He had a really well-built man, you know. This powerful looking guy. And uh, at one point, I was holding my mother's hand. I looked up the same moment she looked down. And she said with a sad voice, he's drunk. And I thought, I want to be drunk. <laughs> <laughs> it was really bad modeling. <laughs> anyway. I began stopping him and to talk to him in town. Some years later, I was too scared of him when I was young. And I asked him about the war and all he wanted to talk about, I remember he told me, Italian women are the best. And I thought, Italian women at D-Day, that's in France, isn't it? So I didn't know how that worked. Then my best friend's father died and I was at the funeral, sitting at the back, small church, and this guy walks in late, reeking like a brewery, sat beside me, and then when the coffin was wheeled out, he saluted, stood up and saluted, and said in this beautiful deep voice, goodbye, my friend. So I asked Mrs. Sully, uh, who was that guy? Well, I know who he was, what's he doing? What was he? She said, except for D-Day, he never left the town of Steinbeck. So my husband, and they, they weren't Mennonites, they were English people. My husband, once a month on a Sunday, would drive him around southern Manitoba to familiarize himself with his home territory. A week after that, he died. I figured his ride was gone, right? I mean, that's humorous and not at the same time. I was going to write a play, and I started writing a play on this guy, and I could not find out very much about him. He remained single his whole life. Can you believe it for a drunk? He repaired watches. How do you do that? Swiss timing. Huh? <laughs> and um, I finally found a, a legion in Winnipeg that knew him and he said, what did he tell you about how he got wounded? Oh, he walked with a stiff gait. And he took, uh, I don't know if he told me, but the story was that he'd been shot in the leg when he landed at D-Day. The guy said, you know what happened? He didn't even carry a rifle. He was an engineer. And he landed right after the soldiers landed and his job was to build bridges that were bombed over the small river so the soldiers could advance. Very dangerous job, actually. And he was inordinately proud, proud of his physique. So they were, had these huge steel beams and an, another engineer and he were gonna carry it. He said, I can do this myself. He hoisted up and his leg buckled. He got shipped back home. Pride.
should have been expelled and shunned. <laughs> anyway. His name was Isa Cajons. Can you translate that? You must be able to. Hmm. Anyway. Any other comments? The story behind the college moving paper. It started accidentally when um, I was working for the Department of Education and I'd run out of paper at home, so I stole it a bunch of paper from my office and didn't check the color and when I got home I found it was blue. And I had to use it then right, because I was working. And then I could, couldn't shake it after that. I like the color blue. I never write any of my creative work on white. That's just for formal letters. I think even letters to friends are probably usually in blue. If you get a letter from me in white, you're not really my friend. <laughs> <laughs> not true, but... Anyways, writers have all kinds of quirks like that. Schiller, the German poet, couldn't write unless he was smelling overripe apples. So every morning the maid would put them in his desk where he wrote. So he had that smell. I know endless writers that can't write without coffee. Uh, there was some writer that couldn't write without yellow paper, notepad. Who knows what these things are? Little superstitions to keep us going. Did you ever ask for your poetry to be published on the Actually, that long poem I told you about that they published sideways, the whole magazine was white except for, the, except for my poem. It was blue paper. <laughs> but no, I, I don't think it would look very good in a book. Blue paper. Anyway. David, here's. Oh, I was just going to say about the, the temperature. Because I'm retired now and Kathy goes to work every day and she comes home. She has to turn up the heat when she comes home because the house has been, we turn the heat down in the night. Yeah. And I start writing and I forget about I never, it. I never forget about it. Yeah. I never turn the temperature up. She comes home freezing. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or what I used to do in Manitoba, where, where it matters, yeah. temperature up or down. <laughs> it doesn't matter on the West Coast. You, you never touch the thermostat. Um, I used it to avoid writing. I'd be writing and I, ah, nothing was coming. So, oh, it's cold. And I'd go and turn up the thermostat and I'd come back. Ah, a little hot. Go back to, <laughs> and that would go on and on. Oh, and suddenly my sock was sticky from honey that my kid dropped in the floor. Oh, got to get new socks on. Throw this in the washer. Do anything to not write. Have you experienced that? Delaying tactics? The danger now is, is the internet. Oh, I bet, yeah. I never so go on the internet. I can't think of anything. I'll just check email. Or I'm going to Google something. I'm doing some research. <laughs> <laughs> 40 minutes know, later. <laughs> Well, I heard someone say the other day that online reading is surface reading. It's not depth reading that you have in books because the links are too easy. And so you're always skimming. Your eyes and your brain is in the habit of skimming, which is not how we read on the page usually. And in page, we often stop to think and so on. It's an interesting idea. And that same person, it was an article I read, actually thinks it's too late to change. Our kids are all gone now. There will never be that same mind, type of mind at work. Sad if that's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They didn't want it read, and I did. Um, and I wanted it read because, as I said before, I thought it made it look a bit more like a novel. I thought, and because there was a suicide and a lot of passion in there, so the color red I thought would work. I like the color red anyway, but I have a red door at home. And yeah. So, yeah, that's why I chose that color. For that. That's the other thing. I've always been inv involved in all my covers from the first book on to varying degrees. At the beginning, they were slow to let me do very much about it, but my last five books have all been designed by my daughter, who is a book designer in Toronto, freelance book designer, and, and we work very well together. Now, what about the title of The Shunning? The Shunning? That wasn't your original. No, I, that's right. I had an initial title that was called Tomorrow It Gives Rain, which I think was a translation from a low German thing I heard my father or my uncle say. Moria you have to rain? Would you say something like that? Tomorrow Gives Rain? So that was my working title, and the publisher actually said, you should call it The Shunning, and said, that's too obvious. But, and it is too obvious in a way. But it's catchy, they thought. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. About him? Well, it's simply the voice to begin with. But I've noticed my whole life I've been drawn to uh, very vulnerable, wounded people, artists. Um, Richard Manuel had a, quite an awful problem with drugs for a while, with alcohol. After he died, I, I, I phoned a guy who had been in his first band when they were 13 or 14 years old, who, by the way, was in the Full Tilt Boogie Band, if anyone knows that, who played on Janis Joplin's last album. Anyways, this guy was from Stratford also. He said when he was 15, he drank a Mickey straight, and you couldn't tell the difference. So he said that told him right off that he had a problem, kind of. And he beat it, and he lost out to it, and he beat it, and he lost out to it. He destroyed his voice, I think. With I have a CD where he's playing in a club in the state of New York a couple months before he dies, and sings with three songs, and then he can't, essentially. He can't hit the notes. It's just it's croaking. And he had a brilliant, brilliant voice. He could jump to a high falsetto. He hung himself. Um, I think he was disappointed with himself somehow. Hung himself in the, some lonely motel room someplace. But these people in, in music have always attracted me because in those days at least, you could hear it in their voices. You didn't know how they'd end up, but you heard there was trouble. And that's interesting to me. I like the sound. I don't know. I don't like happy singing, I guess. <laughs> I'm, I'm being a bit lighthearted there. But. And, and John Lennon, we know he was a troubled guy in many ways. And totally brilliant in a narrow way. And uh, you could hear that in the voice. So I said, when you hear his son sing, you think, wow, he sounds like his dad. You listen a little longer, and he doesn't sound anything like him. Because he doesn't have that yearning in his voice. He doesn't have that drive, that need to do something with your life. Yeah. Well, I think okay. we're going to say uh, thank you once more. And, uh, and I hope uh, those of you who have the opportunity will come back on Friday for the lecture. and. Uh, on Wednesday for Magdalene Redekop's performance on humor, clowning, comedy, and manlight writing. I think she's so. dealing quite a bit with me, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> well, with him, for sure. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much.